And so let's just jump right in, uh, in in a message that we've titled The Good Sheep Fold. The Good Sheep Fold. And so John chapter 10, beginning in verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my Father." there was again a, a division among, uh, among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the words of one who, ha- who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Now, remember, last week in, in the first part of John chapter 10, we saw that Jesus had called himself the good shepherd the good shepherd, which if you remember, that was really a reference to Ezekiel chapter 34. Uh, Because in Ezekiel chapter 34, the, the prophet Ezekiel portrays God himself as the good shepherd, as the shepherd over Israel. And so now when Jesus proclaims that he's the good shepherd, he was once again declaring that he was God in the flesh, that he is God incarnate, the good shepherd incarnate, God in human flesh. And so last week we looked at the good shepherd. And so now this morning, we're going to look at the good sheep fold. Now for our purposes this morning, the, uh, the, the sheep fold portrays the, the, the church. And so in this passage before us this morning, there there are a couple of key phrases that we notice. Uh, The the phrase, one flock, and also the phrase, one shepherd. One flock, one shepherd, which puts the emphasis on unity, the unity of the sheepfold, the oneness of the sheepfold. It is the good sheepfold. So now with that, As we go back now to verses 14 and 15, the focus here is on the one shepherd. Verse 14 says again, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, by way of review, uh, remember last week we we, we saw that that in those days they they sort of had these, these community sheepfolds. Remember, along the hillsides of Judea, you would, you, you would see uh, multiple flocks of sheep just, just all scattered and, and, and kind of grazing along the hillside. And so one shepherd would have his flock here, and then there'd be another flock over here and a different flock over there. Now, at the same time, along the hillsides, you would occasionally find a sheepfold. Now, a sheepfold was, was, a, was a wall made out of stone, a stone wall about three foot high in the shape of a circle. And, and, and they sort of had these community sheepfolds. So, you know, you're a shepherd, and, and so at night you would bring your sheep into that sheepfold, but then another shepherd, he would bring his sheep into the same sheepfold, and still another shepherd would bring his sheep. And so it was a community sheepfold. Now, in addition to that, typically uh, the, the average Jewish family in those days would, would, would have a, a couple or, or a few sheep of their own. Uh, but, but they wouldn't have enough to, to be called a flock. They would just have like, you know, two or three sheep of their own. So in that case, you would often have sort of a, a, a village shepherd, sort of a community shepherd who would take care of everyone else's sheep in the village, in, in the community. Now, listen, shepherding in these days was very dangerous. I mean, you, you, you not only had to watch out for wolves and for lions and for bears, but, but you, you had to watch out for, for marauders and, and for raiders as well who, who, who would try to steal your sheep, even if that meant that they had to kill you in the process. Now, typically speaking, a sheep thief would, would typically wait, wait until nightfall, and then they would climb over the wall of the, of the sheepfold and then slaughter as, as many sheep as they possibly could and then throw them over the wall to their partners on the other side. And so that's why, in many cases, uh, these sheepfolds would often have thorn bushes uh, uh, on top, uh, layered on top of the, of the walls of the sheepfold. You know, so that way it'd make it harder to climb over the walls. It'd be sort of like barbed wire. But then again, the shepherd could also light those thorn bushes on fire to sort of scare off wolves or, or other predators as well. 
Now, by the way, another way that, that thieves would try to steal your sheep was that sometimes they would go to, to one of these community sheep folds and, and they would try to pretend that they were the owners of, uh, of a few of the sheep. You know, they'd say, hey, we're, we're, we live down in one of these villages below and, and we're just here to, to pick up our sheep. And, and so they'd try to pretend that they're one of the owners of, of a few of these sheep. But, but as we said before last week, uh, the, the sheep know the voice of their real shepherd. They, they know the voice of their owner. In fact, I read that back in, in the days of World War II, there were a, a group of soldiers who had tried to, uh, tried to steal a flock of sheep that were along the hillside just outside of Jerusalem. And so they, they, they were kind of driving these sheep and, and, and trying to herd them. And, and, and when the sleeping shepherd woke up and he saw that his flock was, was, was being driven off by these soldiers, he, he called to the flock with, with, with a distinctive sound, with distinctive calls. And as he did... Each sheep, one by one, turned back and came back to their shepherd. Why? Because the sheep know the shepherd's voice. And so it's with that in mind, verse 14, that Jesus says, I know my own and my own know me. But then Jesus adds this line in verse 15. He says, and I will lay down my life for the sheep. Now that line there in verse 15 implies that this was voluntary. That, 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 that no one forced him to do this. No one was making him do this. He voluntarily would lay down his life. But this, this also implies uh, that, that there was a, a sense of responsibility, uh, that he's responsible for the sheep, that he's going to protect these sheep with his very life. Now, I also think that this has, is kind of connected to a law back in Exodus chapter 22, verse 13 in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 22, verse 13, which is a law that had to deal with stealing sheep. You see, in those days, maybe, maybe you're one of the, the village shepherds. You're one of the community shepherds. And so a bunch of different people left their sheep under your care. But let's say that, that something happened and, and one of their sheep gets torn to pieces by a lion or by a bear. And, and now their sheep died under your watch. Well, now in that case, what would happen is that you would have to go to the actual owner of the sheep and bring proof that, you know, maybe, maybe it's a limb or, or maybe it's a, an ear, but you have to, have to bring proof that not only was, was their sheep attacked by a predator, but you bring proof that you did everything you possibly could, that you risked your very life trying to protect that sheep. Now, here's what happened if, if, you, if you couldn't prove it. If you failed to prove that you risked your life to save their sheep, well, then you had to pay for the life of their sheep. And here's how. You had to pay for the life of their sheep with your very own life. Because you failed to protect the life of their sheep, now it would cost you your life. And so there's a sense of responsibility here. But why? Why did they have this law in Exodus 22, 13? Why? Well, because, you know, oftentimes you would have these, these false shepherds, if you would, that, that were kind of running these, these community sheepfolds. And, and maybe they tell you that, that you know, your sheep uh, was, was killed by a lion or by a bear when, in fact, really your sheep had just become a gyro sandwich. And so they had this law. And so Jesus says that he's the good shepherd and that he knows his sheep and his sheep know him and he will lay down his life for the sheep. He will protect his sheep with his very life. So now the focus goes now from the, from the focus being on one shepherd to now the focus is on one flock as we pick it up in verse 16. Jesus says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, and so there will be one flock, one shepherd. Now notice the word fold when he says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Now, most Bible teachers universally agree that, that the fold here speaks of the nation of Israel, the, the, the Jewish people, that the nation of Israel, the, the Jewish people are the sheepfold of God. And, you know, there, there's Old Testament scripture after Old Testament scripture where, 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 where the nation of Israel, the Jewish people are called the sheep of God, and he is called their shepherd. And so the sheepfold, that's the nation of Israel. But then this phrase, other sheep, when it says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold, 
Well, most Bible teachers agree that that phrase, other sheep, speaks of non-Jewish people, or if you would, so-called Gentiles. And so uh, when, when, when Jesus is saying, I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold, and I must bring them in also, in effect, Jesus was, was telling the Jewish people, he was telling the nation of Israel, he's saying, you know what? I'm going to be bringing Gentiles into your sheepfold. But then notice he goes on and, and he says, and there will be one flock, one shepherd. In other words, there won't be a Jewish flock and a Gentile flock. There won't be a, a, a kosher sheepfold and a non-kosher sheepfold. He says uh, there, there's, there's going to be no segregation. He says there's going to be one flock, one shepherd. Now, by the way, that word one, when he says there'll be one flock, it's the exact same Greek word that's used later on over in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, when, when, when the apostle Paul writes and says that in himself, he might make the two into one, that's our key word, into one new man, thus establishing peace and, and might reconcile them both in one body. There's our word again. Both into one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. Now, what are these verses in, in Ephesians chapter 2 talking about? Well, the, th the theme in Ephesians chapter 2 is, is talking about the, the fact that in the church, in the city of Ephesus, there were Jews who had become Christians, Jews who had be believed in Jesus, and there were also Gentiles who believed in Jesus. Gentiles who became Christians, and now they're both in the same church. They're becoming one with each other. But listen, you have to understand how, how revolutionary that was. Because in, in, in that day, in that time, I mean, I mean, the Jewish people absolutely despised Gentiles, non-Jewish people. In fact, in that day, in that culture, the, the Jewish rabbis, and I've, I've told you this before, the rabbis said that, that the Gentiles were created by God to be nothing more than kindling for the flames of hell. And so because of this, the, 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 the Jewish people, I mean, they, they would never even enter the home of a Gentile. They would never eat with a Gentile. They, they would have nothing to do with a Gentile for fear that it might make them unclean themselves. In fact, most rabbis in that day would, would refuse to walk down the same street that Gentiles were walking down. Now, if there was no other choice, if there was no other street to, to walk down, then what the rabbi would do is he'd kind of take his cloak or his robe and, and kind of, you know, snug it up real tight and just kind of huddle down and then kind of scurry down that street as fast as he could, hoping to, to, to protect himself for, from any dust that the Gentiles might kick up as they're walking on those dirt roads. Because they literally believed that, that the very dust of the Gentiles could contaminate them and make them spiritually unclean. And so they're hoping to, to you know, they're, they're trying to protect themselves from the Gentile dust, from, from Gentile cooties, if you would. And so now you, you have Jews who, who've become Christians, and you have Gentiles who've become Christians, and now they're in the same church. And so this is what Ephesians 2 is talking about when it says in, in verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 2, that in himself he might make the two into one new man. Now that word new, it's an interesting word, kainos in the Greek. It, it, this word does, does not mean to, to restore something back to its original condition, like you would like, a, like, like with a classic car, for example, but rather this word means to make something into something that's completely different, uh, unlike anything that ever existed before. You see, a, a Christian is not simply a reconditioned person, but rather a Christian is a brand new person. Even as the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. And so what this is saying is that, listen, a Christian is not simply a Jewish person who now believes in Jesus and is a Christian. It's not simply just a Greek person who now believes in Jesus and now they're a Christian, but rather... Now that you're a Christian, your identity is no longer in your ethnicity. Your identity is in Christ. In other words, your identity is no longer in the fact that, that you're Jewish or that you're Greek or that you're Roman or that you're Spanish or that you're Italian or, or, or that you're you know, Latino. Your, 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 your identity is now in Christ. You're simply a Christian. Your identity is in him. Even as the Bible says in Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
And so despite uh, their cultural differences, despite their ethnic differences, despite their language differences, despite their different backgrounds, there's one thing they had in common. And what is that? Jesus Christ. And so in, in the sheepfold of Israel, any Jewish person who happens to believe in Jesus now is a new creation. And likewise, the other sheep the Gentiles, any Gentile who happens to believe in Jesus is now a new creation. And now the two have become one. They're in one sheepfold. Why? Because they have the same shepherd. They, they, they've become one flock because they have one shepherd. You see, it's the shepherd who makes them one. It's the shepherd who gives them the unity. A.W. Tozer had put it this way years ago. He said, has it ever occurred to you that when 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? And so 100 worshipers meeting together, each one's looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they ever could be possibly before were they to become quote-unquote unity conscious and, and turn their eyes away from God and strive for closer fellowship. In other words... The key to unity is, is not to strive for unity. It's not to have a unity rally, a unity meeting, to, to, to think about unity. No, the key to unity is God. And the closer we get to him, the closer we get to each other. And so we, we are one with each other because we have the same shepherd. There's one flock, one shepherd. But now as we look at verses 17 and 18, the focus here now is on the shepherd who became the lamb. Verse 17, Jesus says, for this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to, to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. And I'd read that, that back in, in New York City, back in, in February 24th of 1925, uh, Dr. Keith Evans, uh, who was a surgeon who, who'd been in practice for, for 37 years, made history by performing, performing a procedure that literally has been done dozens of different times. And so it was a relatively routine procedure. Now his patient was complaining of, of severe abdominal pain. And, and, and after examination, he concluded that his patient needed an appendectomy, a relatively uh, uh, common procedure. Now, what, what made history, the reason he made history was for two reasons. Reason number one was because this was the first time in history that a local anesthetic had ever been used. In fact, Dr. Keith had, had, been, had been arguing for years and years and years that using a local anesthetic was much, much safer. Now, the second reason, reason number two that he made history is because his patient was none other than Dr. Keith himself. You see, no one else was brave enough to, to volunteer to use local anesthesia. And so in this case, the surgeon became the patient. And much in the same way in the passage before us here in John chapter 10, we, we see that, that in the same way that the shepherd gave his life so the sheep may have life. You see, the, the, the good shepherd became the lamb of sacrifice. Now remember, in the Old Testament, and we say Old Testament, that's, that's all of the books of the Bible before the birth of Jesus. And so in the Old Testament, remember, the only way that, that, that your, your sins could be atoned for was for you to go to the temple and, 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 and bring a lamb with you. Now the priest would have you lay your hands on, on that lamb on, on, his, on his forehead, and then the priest would have you pray. Now in the process of laying your hands and praying, what was happening was that symbolically you were transferring your sins off of you and onto that lamb. So therefore, that lamb was literally becoming your substitute, meaning that when that lamb was sacrificed, that, that lamb wasn't dying for anything that he did. No, he was completely innocent. No, that lamb was dying for everything that you did. In the Old Testament, the lamb died so that you can live. But listen to this. Jesus died that you may live. Jesus, the good shepherd, became the lamb of sacrifice. He laid down his life for his sheep, and he did it freely. And now with that, as we look at verses 19 through 21, I want to share a couple of concerns I have about, about the Lord's sheepfold today. And so in verse 19... 
It says, and there was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and he's insane. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the words of one who, who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So now, in this chapter, chapter 10, in the first part of chapter 10 last week, we saw that, that Jesus was the good shepherd, but the religious leaders of the day were the false shepherds. That Jesus was feeding the flock, but they were fleecing the flock. But now this morning, Jesus also tells us that he came so that the Jews and the Gentiles could be in the same fold. So that, so that the Jews and the Gentiles can become one with each other. And so in a sense, because of, of what Jesus has done in each of our lives individually, because of what Jesus has done, then, then no matter how different we are from each other, no matter what our differences are, because of Jesus, we are one. Now, now take a look around this room. It should be pretty easy. Literally, literally, like, to turn around and look at the people in the room. It's only a handful of you. It shouldn't take very long. Now, I don't know if you see what I see, but here's what I see. I see that, that, that a lot of you are different, and by that I mean different. You know, I mean, some of us are tatted, some of you are not, uh, uh, some are, are, are younger, some of you th think you're younger, uh, you know, we, uh, some, of, some of us are upper class and middle class and lower class, people like me, no class, and yet here we are, we're, we're all in the same place. I mean, you know, you look around the room, and, and this looks a lot like the bar scene in Star Wars, right? I mean, just, just a lot of different people. And so when you think about it, I mean, listen, the church is like the only place on the planet where you'd find all these different people from all these different walks of life actually walking together and doing life together. Now listen, that's unity. Amen. Now on that note, I want us to notice something in verse 19, where it says, there was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Now, the word division, schisma in, in the Greek, this is a word that can be translated dissension, but it can be translated a rift or a tear. Now, in the context of verse 19, in the context, we see that, that it was the Lord's enemies. It was the religious leaders of the day who were divided against each other. But now, fast forward some 2,000 years later, and now today, we see that it's the Lord's people. It's the Lord's sheep that are divided against each other. So it's on that note that I want to share with you two concerns that I have about the Lord's sheepfold today. Concern number one is division. Concern number two is isolation. Division and isolation. Let's look at those. Uh, number one, division. Listen, I mean, is it just me or, or are we more divided than we've ever been before? I mean, is it just me or, or, or have you noticed that, that people are just angry all the time? In fact, uh, one psychologist, Joshua uh, Morgenstein said, quote, the country is now dealing with three different disasters superimposed on top of one another, the pandemic, the economic fallout, and thirdly, the civil unrest. And, and a common way of responding is anger. Another survey reveals that 77% that of Americans say that our country is, is more divided now than it was before the outbreak. And think about it. We, we're divided over everything. We're, we're divided over, over wearing masks or, or not wearing masks. We're divided over contact tracing or we're divided now over to get a vaccination or not to get the vaccination. We're divided over this and we're divided over that. We're divided over everything. And I've got to tell you that division is taking its toll on the church. And by church, I don't just mean this church. I mean the church, the, 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 the body of Christ, the church at large. In fact, a recent study uh, by the Barna Research Group says that one in five churches are closing their doors due to COVID. One out of every five churches are closing their doors due to COVID. In fact, in a, in a separate survey, pastors were asked what their most significant struggles are during this time, this time of pandemic, uh, the, the, this economic trial, uh, the, 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 the racism, uh, political turmoil, all of this. What, 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 what is their number one struggle? And by far the number one answer was division, disunity in their congregations. These pastors that were interviewed said that, that you know, they have people in their church that, that on one hand are, are scared to death right now. They're, they're afraid to go anywhere. They're afraid to, to, to even breathe. But then on the other hand, you, you have people who, who, quite frankly, are going to go all Karen on you if, if you don't wear your mask. 
And then on that note, you, you have others that, that are convinced that this whole thing is a hoax and that it's a conspiracy. And, and then you even have those who, 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 quite frankly, get angry at you if you ask them to wear a mask. I mean, we've all seen these videos. I'm sure you've seen the videos of people at, at, at grocery stores and at restaurants who actually get into fist fights just because somebody asked them to wear a mask. And so listen, in the midst of this virus, division has gone viral. One editor, Jonathan Merritt, put it this way, an editor for The Atlantic, he said, if the coronavirus is a test of our collective character, then some American Christians are flat out flunking. Now, experts believe that perhaps one statistic that may indicate a, a significant contributor to, to, to our division is social media. One sociologist put it this way. He said, quote, social media is pitched to us as, as a way for us to stay connected to our loved ones. But in reality, social media is making us antisocial. He said, Facebook is designed to feed you content that will provoke a reaction in order to keep you on Facebook as long as possible. And as a result, we've become more antisocial, angrier, and more divided. Another study by LifeWay Research says that on any given day, Christians in America are more than two times more likely to open Facebook than they are to open their Bibles. And that's verified by another study that says that 66% of American Christians use Facebook every day, but only 32% of American Christians use their Bibles every day. And the study concludes that many Christians are being shaped more by social media than they are by the Scripture. And so that's concern number one, division. But then my second concern is isolation. Listen to this. Isolation leads to devastation. We must never forget that one of the tactics of the enemy of our soul is to isolate so that he can devastate. Now, I, I read recently about, about some of the differences between sheep versus goats, especially when they're under attack. Now, I, I read that when, when, when goats, when, when a herd of goats are under attack, they, they huddle together, they, they form a circle, uh, and, and, and they're facing the outside. That way they, they, they can use their horns to defend each other. But when sheep are under attack, they don't huddle together. They, they don't defend each other. No, when sheep are under attack, they scatter. They're like, run, every sheep for himself. You know, they just, they just scatter. But listen to this. When we're alone, when we isolate, we become easy pickings for the enemy himself. What do you call a sheep without a shepherd? Medium rare. We must never forget the warning in 1 Peter 5, 8 that says that the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so right now in the, in the midst of this pandemic, there are people who are choosing to isolate for health reasons. Maybe it's because of what they do for a living uh, or maybe it's because of their own health reasons. And, and so they're isolating. They're, they're staying safe. And listen, that is smart. That is wise. And you should do that. But at the same time, can I say to you, that, you that, that, that while it may be healthy to isolate, it can also be devastating to isolate. Right now they're showing that, that the numbers of suicide and, and depression have almost doubled since the pandemic started. And so can I just encourage you that, that while you're trying to stay away from COVID, make sure that you connect with his beloved. Make sure you stay connected. I mean, listen, we, we've got online church. We, we've got Zoom Bible studies. We, you know, for that matter, you've got a thing called a phone. You, you can call someone. You can FaceTime a, another brother in Christ, a, a sister in Christ, and just talk with them and, and, and get encouraged by them and have them pray for you. In fact, on that note, if there's a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ, a fellow Christian that you haven't seen for a while in person, then maybe you should reach out to them. Maybe, maybe you should call them. Maybe you should check in on them and, and see if they're okay and, and pray for them and, and, and keep a connection with them. The Bible tells us in Romans 15, verse 5, it says, May the God of endurance and, and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in, in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Now we notice this word harmony. When he says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another. That word harmony is the Greek word phroneo. 
It's a word that can be translated like-minded, but literally this word means to, to, to strive to seek someone else's benefit. Strive to seek someone else's benefit, what, what's best for them and not for yourself. You see, that's the key to having harmony. The key to having unity is that we strive to, to seek someone else's benefit. We, we go out of our way. We, if we haven't seen them for a while, we, we go out of our way to check in on them, to touch base with them, to, to stay connected to them. We, we do what's best for them and not for ourselves. And listen to this. No, no, matter, no matter what our differences are, uh, uh, whether we have different views on the pandemic, whether we have different views on, on wearing masks or, or different views on this or different views on that, let us never forget the one thing we have in common. What's that? Namely, Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. Amen. Listen to this. The one thing that unites us is far greater than all the other things that could ever divide us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you that you are our good shepherd. And that because we have one shepherd, we can be one flock. No matter what our backgrounds are, no matter, no matter uh, what we've done in life, no matter where we've come from, no matter how we think, no, no matter how opposite we are from each other, no matter how different we are from each other, we have one shepherd, and because of our one shepherd, we can be one with each other. And Lord, what a powerful testimony it is for this world, this, this out-of-control world, to look at us as different as we are from each other, to look at us and see that we are one with each other. I mean, after all, Jesus, didn't you say that, that, that they, the world, will know that we are your disciples by your love for one another? So Lord, in the midst of this pandemic, help us to model your love. In the midst of this crazy economy, in the midst of this, of this political turmoil, in the midst of racial dissension, Help us to model your love that the world would see our one shepherd and want to be a part of this one flock. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let's stand and sing the Lord one last time.